It is also my distinct honor and pleasure now to welcome our first speaker today for you, and that is Vice Admiral Robert Sharp, who is the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, Admiral Sharp is the seventh director of NGA, and he has only been with the NGA since this February. In past years, for those who've been here, you had the privilege of seeing his predecessor, Director Cardillo, up here on stage, and we're thrilled to welcome Admiral Sharp. Prior to his current role, Admiral Sharp served as the Commander of the Office of Naval Intelligence and Director of the National Maritime Intelligence Integration Office. Before that, he was the Director for Intelligence at U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, I won't go into all the details for his bio as we won't for any of the speakers because they're all available to you online, so I encourage you to read a lot more about the Admiral after he's done talking. Uh, but as we've said, the AGS has a long-standing, strong relationship with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and we are so thrilled to welcome its new director, Vice Admiral Robert Sharp, to the stage. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. I, I think he could feel me sneaking up on him, um, although I am somewhat stealthy sometimes, I've been told, somewhat ninja-like. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Reiser for, for uh, his welcoming remarks and then also for his leadership in putting this together. And I tell you, I did go on and look at the seven themes uh, in advance of this, and I thought, this is, this is really impactful. I think the topics that you're teeing up here to discuss are really relevant and really important, and I'm looking forward to, to being here with you all and helping to participate in some of those discussions. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Price, Dr. Tucker, the American Geographical Society Council and the entire ASG for inviting me here. This is, this is my first symposium. Um, I'm, I'm predicting it's gonna be my best ever. And uh, I'm also predicting it won't be my last, because um, I, I, I look forward to these sorts of venues where you bring people together, you exchange ideas, you stay connected. It's, it's really important. Um, so thank you to, to AGS for your leadership. And then if you're feeling left out, um, I want to thank all the rest of you. So nobody's left out. That's about as inclusive as I can be. I want to thank you for taking the time and the energy for being here. And, uh, I want to challenge you to make sure that you meet somebody you don't know and exchange contact information, and I want, to, I want to challenge you to make sure that you're staying connected after you leave here, um, because that's really important in, in addressing some of the challenges that we're facing these days and being what our nation, I think, needs us to be. Um, I was listening to the, the uh, introductory remarks before I came out here, and I was thinking, I just realized that, that I'm the first real speaker after lunch, and the conventional wisdom in speaking is always uh, never follow lunch nor a circus act. Um, thankfully, I'm not following a circus act. I've added to that never follow Sue Gordon, uh, who's a hero of mine. If you've ever seen her speak, you never want to follow her. Um, but I got to tell you, I was real thrilled about this opportunity to be here with this group. And as I looked at who you are and what you do, and I, I think I heard the word geography uh, more in the last 15 minutes than I've heard in the last 15 weeks, which is a shame and a travesty. Um, I, I look out here and I see a bunch of kindred spirits. I really feel like I am amongst uh, people who have common focus and common purpose, and it's just a joy to be here. And I look forward not only after you know, getting to speak to you here today, but also to, to spend the remainder of the day uh, getting to know you and, and interacting with you. Uh, so for those of you who don't know the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, I'm not going to go into great detail about who we are, but I think our motto really says it all as to why I find you kindred spirits. Uh, our, our motto, know the earth, show the way, understand the world. Uh, we say we exist for that middle part, to show the way, to get you from point A to point B, physically, on time, safely, um, and we do so uniquely by combining a knowledge of the earth and an understanding of the world, uh, to show you the way either physically or in the decision process. 
And is that knowledge of the earth uh, that you all, I think, are so passionate about as well? You know, a deep understanding from seabed to space, um, which involves sciences of bathymetry, topography, aerography, aerography, geodesy, you know, that science aspect of it. And then connecting it to what's happening and where. And there's a huge human dimension to that, and I was really encouraged to, to hear the uh, outcry and the, the uh, uh, the celebrating the importance of connecting human dimension to geography and how important that is to the world. Um, I'm more than a little biased because I'm the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence, but I think this is the coolest area. I tell people it's, it's where it's at, literally, right? I mean, it is actually literally where it's at. Everything happens, happens in time and space. And we collectively are the people that uh, help people understand what that is and what that means. Now in his travel books, The Innocents Abroad, Mark Twain wrote this quote, quote, God created war so that Americans would learn geography. I, I, I hope that resonates with a number of you. Uh, and I hope uh, you realize that uh, we can't let that be the truth, um, but too often it is the truth. And some of that was discussed already up here, so I won't belabor the fact on the importance of the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles. As you know, the treaty concluded the war to end all wars. It also redrew the boundaries of the Middle East and reset colonial empires in Africa and Asia. And many of those boundary decisions set into motion the conflicts that followed throughout the 20th century and linger to this day. Unfortunately, some of those lines were drawn without a full appreciation for all the perspectives afforded by geography. Without the perspective of taking in ge geographical features, totally. Without the perspective of adding the human dimension to those decisions. And we're seeing the repercussions of that today. You know, it wasn't mentioned, but for example, all you have to do is look at the Middle East and the boundaries created by the fateful Sykes-Picot Pact of 1916, which contributes to the headlines we read today and the issues we're dealing with on a daily basis about those very borders. And it was just 30 years ago this month that the Berlin, Berlin Wall came down. The Cold War began to come to an end and the Iron Curtain was no more. You think about this. The wall itself was the epitome of a bad border, a bad boundary, to those who felt trapped by it, to those who literally tried to climb it and paid with their lives, and later to those who tore it down. And in other places around the world, boundaries remain lines of extreme tension. The border between North and South Korea continues to demand our attention nearly 70 years after the end of hostilities there. I'll tell you, I was up on that border um, a couple of months ago, and tensions were a little easier, but it's still a border. And as you saw in, in the news even today, there are still issues that we're dealing with that are a result of that border. Now, in recent years, we've, we've seen the world become more interconnected. Uh, there's, I have a saying that there's no such thing as local problems anymore. Right? They all cross national boundaries. They cross, cross regional boundaries. They have this global dimension to them, really requiring a global perspective and global approaches to solving solutions. They also don't exist in isolation. You know, the complex problems that we're dealing with today start to, to collide in time and space in ways that are extremely, extremely complex. So yes, the technological advances of the late 20th century have connected parts of the world in ways that no one could have imagined at the end of World War II, let alone Mark Twain, Mark Sykes, and Francois-Georges Picot. Um, but we can't deny that borders still are extremely relevant. And although the, the uh, world is extremely interconnected, the lines that we have drawn have an impact and contribute to complexity and to conflict. Now we mentioned the, uh, the themes that, were, that you're gonna be concentrating on here today and, and the guidance that I adhere to was mentioned, I think the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, we are part of the intelligence community and I, I report to the Office of Director of Naval or National Intelligence and we're also a combat support agency so we report to the Secretary of Defense. And recent guidance from our government 
the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, not depicted here, the national intelligence strategy, have done a pretty good job in describing the complexity of the strategic environment. And I think that the theme one uh, correspondence that you had, the theme one characterization of that strategic environment was consistent as well. You know, and it highlighted the fact that we, ha we now have a rising China. We have a resurgent uh, Russia. Um, we have a return of great power competition. And these documents describe what it is the U.S. government needs to be doing in that sort of strategic environment. This is guidance from my boss, and I'm a big believer in what my boss finds interesting, I find fascinating. So you will not be surprised to see that uh, NGA's strategy for 2025, and we're working on one for 2035, also is focused on the return of great power competition and doing what our nation needs to do to compete in that great power competition. The strategy itself was signed out, hang on one second, by Director Cardillo. He had a strategy 2025, I read it. Um, I liked it, it resonated with me, um, but it had a facing uh, introduction that had the signature of Robert Cardillo, and I thought, I need to change that. So we did it reissue Strategy 2025. It resonated with me because it has four easy key components, people, partnerships, mission today, and mission tomorrow. I'm passionate about people. In the special operations community, they have a great saying that I've uh, taken on as my own, which are humans are more important than hardware. Think about that. Humans are more important than hardware. A lot of times we get uh, fascinated by technology, but we re need to remember that it's our humans, our critical thinkers, that are our strength. And the women and the men of NGA are individuals that are on the watch, standing the watch, 24-7, 365 around the globe. They're, they are part of what our former Secretary of Defense described as our sentinels and our guardians, the sentinels and the guardians of our nation. And we are in competition for best and brightest. So you will see that within our people strategy, we are looking at how we spot assess, recruit, and bring into our agency and our enterprise our nation's best and brightest. We're looking at how, once we have them on board, we continue to invest in them professionally, in their education, and to grow them as leaders. And we are looking to partner very closely with universities um, at the graduate and undergraduate level, and the high schools, and the kindergarten through 12 which was also why I was passionate about coming here. Because I'm convinced that our future workforce, I mean, I know our future workforce, is sitting in our schools across our nation. And I want them to be thinking about geography. I want them to be thinking about geospatial sciences. I want them to be excited about the art of the possible and the careers open to them in making this world a better place by pursuing those sorts of academics and our partnerships. I'm convinced that our strength as an agency, as an intelligence community, as a nation is vested in our people and our partnerships. I think it's our comparative advantage as a nation. I think it's our strength. You heard a number of the, the uh, introductions here talk about the, the importance of diversity and inclusion. Uh, I am a huge fan of diversity and inclusion and bringing in everybody from across our nation, best and brightest, flicker of light behind the pupils and desire um, is key to success. And throughout my 30 plus years in the Navy, I have seen us prog make progress where we opened up doors, where we were not being inclusive. And each time we did, we were better. And we looked back and we said, why, why didn't we do that 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, right? So once again, we're in the business of winning. People, partnerships, key to our success going uh, forward into the future. I'm going to talk to a little bit about the future when I get to mission tomorrow, and I'm going to highlight for you some areas where I'm really excited about how we might strengthen our partnership with academia and, and with industry. 
people and partnerships mission today. So we do a lot of different things for our nation. We have a broad range of customers. Uh, we serve our national policy, policy decision makers. We service our warfighting community, all of the Department of Defense. We service first responders um, who are uh, relying on our products and services to be able to conduct humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. Uh, we also partner very closely with non-government organizations. You know, if somebody needs our products to know the earth, understand the world, so that they can be successful in accomplishing their mission, um, that's what we're interested in doing. And on the geography and geospatial science side of the house, that knowledge of the earth has us pretty busy. On our maritime side of the house, we just celebrated 150 years, way before NGA was an NGA, but 150 years of putting out notice to mariners, to mariners across the globe so that they understand what dangers are out there. Our aeronautical division and office um, works real closely to provide the products and services that all our Department of Defense aircraft need to operate safely around the globe. Um, we also share that information with the FAA. So if you're flying around in the world, there's, there's a good chance that we have at least contributed uh, to the safety of your operations. You know, that's the importance of geospatial information. On the geodetic side of the house, and the geomatics, um, we continue to, to provide the support and the uh, uh, maintenance of the world magnetic model. So you think about that, the WGS84 grid that underpins everybody's perception of what's happening where. Uh, we remain involved in this. I was describing to people who don't get involved in this science that the, and I love that I have so many educators here, that the earth isn't really round, right? It's kind of squishy and, and different shaped, like my head, and it's always changing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's things involved in, in magnetic variation that, that we need to know. And we have individuals who are steeped in that knowledge and are excited about that sort of science. And I always warn people, if you get them in the room, they can deoxygenate a room just talking about that for hours and hours because they're so excited. But we need that sort of excitement. We need that sort of expertise to be able to do the job that we need to be able to do. Our uh, geomedics also works with the Air Force on uh, maintaining the GPS constellation and making that more precise more accurate, more timely, more relevant. If you think about the impact that the GPS system has, it's not just for the Department of Defense, it's really baked into everything everybody's doing everywhere. And our Office of Geography provides integrated geographic data, product services. Uh, we have human geographers, we have political geographers, we have cartographers. So those of you who are looking at, hey, what can you do with these sorts of skill sets? Um, I'm interested in them. I'm interested in those people. I'm interested in them being successful either with us, with our enterprise, or with people like us that do this sort of business. But we can't just stand still. We all realize that the world continues to change, the world continues to evolve, and there's a couple things that are challenging us um, that we're tackling, um, leaning forward into. And one of those things is just an exponential increase in the quantity and the quality of data, right? If you look at uh, how we used to do business 20 years ago, 30 years ago compared to today, it's completely different. And we would be stupid to not realize that 20, 30 years from now, it's gonna continue to be different. But it is daunting sometimes when I look at the investments that are made by international partners, by commercial partners, by our own government, that's gonna increase the types and the quality of data that we're bringing in and, and need to consume. Along those lines, uh, we, along with everybody else, are thinking about artificial intelligence and the ways that the, that the uh, NGA is, is talking about artificial intelligence. We use an acronym AAA, and I have to remind the aviators right away that's not anti-aircraft artillery because they start getting uh, antsy on me. It's artificial intelligence automation and augmentation, and it's really 
looking at partnering with machines, levering machines so that machines can do what machines do best, you know, with ones and zeros. Leveraging machines to do what machines do best so that humans can do what they do best, which is think critically, add context. Um, there's, there's value added from the human mind. What we're trying to do with auto, artificial intelligence, augmentation, and automation is to be able to ease the burden of all that data that's coming at us. And then I promised a teaser on a way that we think we are postured to, to a partner with this community more effectively. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in St. Louis. And for those of you don't, who don't know, uh, NGA, about half of our workforce is in Springfield, Virginia. About 25% is out in St. Louis um, with, with uh, ties to uh, defense mapping agency uh, history. And then the other 25% is, is dispersed around the globe in over 100 locations. But out in St. Louis, we are going to be uh, ground, breaking ground on a new site that we're going to be building over the next five years out in St. Louis. And this is to replace a, a site that we have right now that dates back um, prior to Civil War, and it's, it's, uh, it's done being upgraded, um, so we need a new site. And uh, by design, we're going to have about 20% of the, the workspace unclassified so that we can bring in representatives from academia and industry and talk about the tools and the techniques that we use, not only within the national security realm, but have those tools and tech techniques and techniques that have applicability in just making life and society better. We're convinced that that's really important, not only for us as an agency, but for us as a nation moving forward. So if you haven't been out to St. Louis, you need to go there. Yeah, you need to go there. You need to see what's happening. They are touting themselves as a future geotech hub uh, of this nation. They're using uh, great hooks and saying things like Silicon Prairie, which I think is a, is a great hook. Um, and in addition to our investment, there's a lot of investment going on around us from government and from industry. And we are looking at uh, strengthening our partnership with the local universities in meaningful ways and the K through 12 system as well. All right, we have to change the times to be relevant in the future. Boundaries and borders on land and even at sea have existed for as long as mankind has been territorial, right? So forever. This, this stuff isn't new, uh, and it's not going to go away. Uh, L. Welch Pogue, probably a lot of you don't know who he was. He was the chair of the Civil Aeronautics Board under FDR. And he said this, unlike the boundaries of the sea by the shorelines, the ocean of air laps at the borders of every state, city, town, and home throughout the world. Uh, the biggest difference with air, and I'd, I'd throw in there some other areas, you know, that, that, that need to be looked at, space, uh, cyber. Um, compared to those, you know, although things are hard to, deline to delineate in those spaces, um, we don't live there for long stretches. We, we interact with them for short periods of time. Um, that's very different than the rest of the planet, right? And the boundaries that exist on the water or the boundaries that exist uh, on, the, on the land. Um, so in delineating those boundaries and working through those boundaries and those disputes, I talked about uh, some of the partnerships and the importance of our partnerships. You're going to hear from some members from State Department, but one of the, the strong partnerships we have at NGA is, is with the State Department. And uh, we work with State Department on a daily basis, and if we haven't touched base in a couple of days, we have a reoccurring drumbeat with them, just so we can talk about borders and boundaries and the implications um, across the globe. And I was going to highlight uh, we had worked very effectively uh, with predecessor to NGA, defense mapping agencies and cartographers, working through the Dayton Peace Accords, right? And just bringing the power of GeoWit to those individuals who are fighting and killing each other based off of, of their interpretation of where lines needed to be drawn. And it was a powerful tool to inject some reality as to 
why lines should be drawn based off of not just a flat projection, but based off of population densities, based off of geographic features. And it really demonstrated the power of, of geography and geospatial intelligence and geospatial approaches to conflict resolution. And we continue to work with the State Department very closely. And just recently, uh, as an example, last spring, the U.S. officially recognized the Golan Heights as part of the State of Israel. Now, the system began with the State Department when that happened, issuing an official notification of the change. And then NGA's partnership and contributions was in modifying the borders on all U.S. government maps of the area. What I want to get across here is that boundaries and borders, even in a seemingly borderless world, even when we're more connected, they still have an impact. They are still driving national security discussions. They are still driving uh, international discussions on a, in a real and meaningful way. And here's another good example of the importance of understanding where things are happening in time and space. In humanitarian assistance and disaster response missions, or what happens to internally displaced persons and refugees from violence, or those seeking help from disease, like a few years ago, and today with the Ebola crisis in West, Western Africa and what we're dealing with in the Democratic Republic of Congo. These lines on the maps matter. The understanding of what's happening where matters. Our biggest challenge is authoritative source material for data sets. I was having a discussion uh, at lunch about working with local populations and the importance of that and how powerful it can be. There are some individuals that think the map is truly all mapped. The world is all mapped, that it's, we have uh, authoritative, authoritative data everywhere all the time. I think people in this room understand that that's not the case and that we have plenty of work to be done. Talking of partnerships, this is a partnership we're really proud of as well. The, the, the world doesn't change or doesn't stay the same, right? I think this, this audience understands this um, pretty, pretty uh, real and in, in measured perspectives. But the Arctic is a great example of this. You know, the Arctic today is not the Arctic that it was 30 years ago. And in partnering with the University of Minnesota, Minnesota with the University of Illinois, and with the National Science Foundation, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency has, has worked with those entities to help describe and depict the changes to help inform so people know what it is physically and then help inform also discussions on what are the security implications. So I got another great quote here. Uh, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I would say that those who cannot remember their geography are also in danger of repeating it. The history of what we've dealt with before has a lot to contribute into how we deal with security challenges today and going into the future. The ability to use geography to realistically display and convey the context and the content of what we're looking at um, on a daily basis, I've seen it, helps, helps provide the clarity that is needed for our decision makers to make sure they are acting properly, that they aren't overreacting um, when you can give them that sort of context and content. And I, my speechwriters really like Mark Twain. Um, actually, I really like Mark Twain too because he had a, a way with words. But this is just a good demonstration of, of time and space and the connections and how they matter uh, over, over time. Every person started life out as a child at some location in life. Uh, we, we have a, a, a fond connection at NGA with Mark Twain because he started life 120 miles southeast of a small town called Hannibal, Missouri. Um, 120 miles southeast of a small town called Hannibal, Missouri, uh, which is uh, where St. Louis is. Let me see if I have that right. All you geographers are going, wait, that can't be right. 
That's because I had that wrong. Hannibal is southeast. St. Louis is southwest. Thank you. Northwest. Thank you. And that's where Mark Twain spent his boyhood, growing up in the great state of Missouri as young Sam Clemens. And every person's life on this globe ends somewhere precisely as well. And in 1910, Sam Clemens' funeral was just five miles south of us. I'm convinced it's south this time at the old Rick Presbyterian Church on Fifth Avenue and 37th. Now, since I started with Mark Twain, let me finish with him. This is one of my favorite things that the old riverboat pilot ever wrote. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. And if you think about the comments that were made before I came out here on the importance of, of geography, and not just memorizing 50 states, right? But really thinking about geography and human geography and the inter interaction between physical and human and our life on this planet and getting out amongst it and learning it and living it and breathing it. That is what's necessary for us today. And it's, the geography is important because of the people because people matter. NGA and elsewhere in the US government where we unquestionably need to know what, when, and where serious events happen, this is a critical, critical educational area, right? This is an area where we need to be the best. We need to be the best in the world at geography and geographical sciences. And educators of geography, you matter too. You matter more than most. You matter more than people think that you matter. Not at least because you're training the next generation of civil servants who are gonna to continue to take national security seriously, because the rest of the world takes the training of geographers and the delineation borders very seriously. Um, I was meeting with a group this morning. We were talking about who is training who, where, in what sort of sciences. And this is an area where we used to be the best in the world, at geography, at geographical sciences. This is an area that's critical to us, for us to understand, to know the earth and understand the world so that we can show the way. Um, so I wanna conclude by once again thanking you for who you are and what you do. Um, it is critical to every facet of what we are trying to do as a nation. I have a, a biased view towards national security, but remember, everything that happens, happens someplace, sometime. And understanding that foundational aspect of space and time is critical to success. So thank you.